been Washington's biggest mystery since Watergate. What kind of dog will the Obamas choose? Our resident veterinarian, Dr. We have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. And look, li this is one time. Forget the conspiracy. Listen to our government agencies. These guys are telling the truth. You know, there's no conspiracy here, folks. Just right. get your damn vaccine. All right. All right. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Mercury-containing vaccines may help not harm kids, according to two new studies in the journal Pediatrics. There have been widespread concerns that mercury-based preservatives in vaccines might impair the neurological development of children. These new studies suggest that the opposite, that the preservatives may actually be associated with improved behavior and mental performance. I think people should be careful what they wish for on China. You know, if China were to revalue its currency, or China is to start making, say, toys that don't have lead in them, or food that isn't poisonous, their costs of production are going to go up, and that means prices at Walmart here in the United States are going to go up too. So I would say China is our greatest friend right now. They're keeping prices low, and they're keeping prices for... Today, six corporations control all major media in the United States, including the principal television networks. These six corporate entities, in turn, control the information being broadcast on a daily basis. The average American adult watches more than four hours of television each day. The constant flow of entertainment, news and information that is consumed by the American public shapes their perception of the reality in which they live. By controlling the dissemination of information, broadcasters and their corporate heads are able to control the masses. The constant, carefully shaped messages on television guide the public to predetermined conclusions. Therefore, TV has become a weapon of mass persuasion. In order to take back our minds and our lives, we must first unplug the signal. Turn off your televisions. Cancel your cable and satellite subscriptions. Seek alternative news sources. Spend time with your family and connect with your neighbors and local community. Discuss and learn. Allow new information to challenge your thoughts and opinions. When we unplug the signal, we begin to realize that the world matrix that surrounds us is false. Many things we once thought of as true are lies. Never let us forget the truth will not be televised. What do I need to know about children and television? Television has its good sides. It can be entertaining and educational and can open up new worlds for kids, giving them a chance to travel the globe, learn about different cultures, and gain exposure to ideas they may never encounter in their own community. Shows with a pro-social message can have a positive effect on kids' behavior. Programs with positive role models can influence viewers to make positive lifestyle changes. However, and more ominously, the reverse can also be true. Kids are likely to learn things from TV that parents don't want them to learn. TV can affect kids' health, behavior, and family life in negative ways. It's worthwhile for parents to think about what role they want TV to play in their family. Consider, a great deal is known about children and television. Because there have been thousands of studies on this subject, researchers have studied how TV affects kids' sleep, weight, grades, behavior, and more. It's worth looking at what the research says when deciding how to manage television in your family. Spending time watching TV can take time away from healthy activities like playing outside with friends, eating dinner together as a family, or reading. TV time also takes away from participating in sports, music, arts, and other activities that require practice to become skillful. TV viewers start earlier than other forms of media often beginning before age two. In recent years, TV, video, and DVD programs geared to babies and toddlers have come on the market, and now even a cable channel for babies. We don't know yet what effect TV viewing by babies may have on their development. We do know that time spent watching TV replaces time spent interacting with caregivers and other children. Social interaction is critical to a baby's health and development. How big a presence is TV in kids' lives? 
TV viewing among kids is at an eight-year high. On average, children two to five spend 32 hours a week in front of a TV watching television, DVDs, DVRs, and videos, and using game consoles. Kids ages 6 to 11 spend about 28 hours a week in front of the TV. The vast majority of this viewing, 97%, is of live TV. 71% of 8 to 18 year olds have a TV in their bedroom. 54% have a DVD VCR player. 37% have cable TV or satellite. 20% have premium channels. Father and daughter watching TV media technology now offers more ways to access TV content such as on the internet, cell phones, and iPods. This has led to an increase in time spent viewing TV even as TV set viewing has declined by 41%. In about two-thirds of households, the TV is usually on during meals. In 53% of households of 7th to 12th graders, there are no rules about TV watching. In 51% of households, the TV is on most of the time. Kids with a TV in their bedroom spend on average 1.5 more hours per day watching TV with kids that do not have TVs in their bedroom. Many parents encourage their toddlers to watch TV. As you can see, if your child is typical, TV is playing a very big role in their life. Here are some key research findings to keep in mind as you decide what kind of role you want TV to play in your family. TV viewing is probably replacing activities in your child's life that you would rather have them do. Things like playing with friends, being physically active, getting fresh air, reading, playing imaginatively, doing homework, and doing chores. Kids who spend more time watching TV, both with and without parents and siblings present, spend less time interacting with family members. Excessive TV viewing can contribute to poor grades, sleep problems, behavior problems, obesity, and risky behavior. Most children's programming does not teach what parents say they want their children to learn. Many shows are filled with stereotypes, violent solutions to problems, and mean behavior. Advertisers target kids on average. Children see tens of thousands of TV commercials each year. These include many ads for unhealthy snacks, foods, and drinks. Children and youth see on average 2,000 beer and wine ads on TV each year. Kids see favorite characters smoking, drinking, and involved in sexual situations and other risky behavior. Does TV affect children's brain development? With television programs and even a cable channel designed and marketed specifically for babies, whether kids under two years of age should be watching becomes an important question. While we are learning more all the time about early brain development, we do not yet have a clear idea of how television may affect it. Some studies link early TV viewing with latter attention problems such as ADHD. However, other experts disagree with these results. One study found that TV viewing before age three slightly hurt several measures of latter cognitive development, but that between ages three and five it is slightly helped by reading scores. The American Academy of Pediatrics takes a better safe than sorry stance on TV viewing for young children. It may be tempting to put your infant or toddler in front of the television, especially to watch shows created just for children under age two. But the American Academy of Pediatrics says, don't do it. These early years are crucial in a child's development. The Academy is concerned about the impact of television programming intended for children younger than age two and how it could affect your child's development. Pediatricians strongly oppose targeting programming, especially when it's used to market toys, games, dolls, unhealthy food, and other products to toddlers. Any positive effect of television on infants and toddlers is still open to question, but the benefits of parent-children interaction are proven. Under age two, talking, singing, reading, and listening to music or playing are far more important to a child's development than any television show. In addition, TV can discourage and replace reading. Reading requires much more thinking than television. And we know that reading fosters young people's healthy brain development. Kids from families that have the TV on a lot spend less time reading and being read to and are less likely to be able to read. 
What about TV and aggressive or violent behavior? Literally thousands of studies since the 1950s have asked whether there is a link between exposure to media violence and violent behavior. All but 18 of these have answered yes. The evidence from research is overwhelming. According to the AAP, extensive research evidence indicates that media violence can contribute to aggressive behavior. Desensitization to violence, nightmares, and fear of being harmed. Watching violent shows is also linked with having less empathy towards others. On average, an American child will see 200,000 violent acts and 16,000 murders on television by the age of 18. Two-thirds of all programming contains violence. Programs designed for children more often contain violence than adult. Most violent acts go unpunished on television and are often accompanied by humor. The consequences of human suffering and loss are rarely depicted. Many shows glamorize violence. Television often promotes violent acts as a fun and effective way to get what you want without consequences. Even in G-rated animated movies and DVDs, violence is common, often as a way for the good characters to solve their problems. Every single U.S. animated feature film produced between 1937 and 1999 contained violence, and the amount of violence with the intent to injure has increased over the years. Even good guys away. beating up bad guys gives a message that violence is normal and okay. Many children will try to be like their good guy heroes in their play. Children imitate the violence they see on TV. Children under age 8 cannot always tell the difference between reality and fantasy, making them more vulnerable to learning from and adopting as reality the violence they see on TV. Repeated exposure to TV violence makes children less sensitive towards its effects on victims and the human suffering it causes. A University of Michigan researcher demonstrated that watching violent media can affect willingness to help others in need. A 15-year-long study by University of Michigan researcher found that the link between childhood TV violence viewing and aggressive and violent behavior persists into adulthood. A 17-year-long study found that teenage boys who grew up watching more TV each day are more likely to emit acts of violence than those who watch less. Fears caused by TV can cause sleep problems in children. Scary looking things like grotesque monsters especially frighten children aged 2 to 7. Telling them that the images aren't real doesn't help because kids under age 8 can't always tell the difference between fantasy and reality. Many children exposed to scary movies regret that they watched because of the intensity of their fright reactions. that they may be a victim of violence or a natural disaster. Violent threats shown on TV can cause school-aged kids 8 to 12 to feel fright and worry. The when the threat is shown as news, it creates stronger fear. How does watching TV affect performance in school? TV viewing may replace activities that we know help with school performance. 
such as reading, doing homework, pursuing hobbies, and getting enough sleep. One research study found that TV's effect on education were long-term. The study found that watching TV as a child affected educational achievements at age 26. Watching more TV in childhood increased chances of dropping out of school and decreased chances of getting a college degree, even after controlling for confounding factors. Watching TV at age 4 was one factor found to be associated with bullying in grade school. Can TV influence children's attitudes towards themselves and others? Let's take a look at what kids see on TV and how it affects their belief about race and gender. Children learn to accept the stereotypes represented on television. After all, they see them over and over. When non-whites are shown on TV, they tend to be stereotyped. A review of the research on gender bias shows that the gender-biased and gender-based stereotyped behaviors and attitudes that kids see on television do affect how they see male and female roles in our society. Television and movies do not often show Asians or Asian Americans and when they do, they fail to show the diversity of the Asian American culture. Thin women are disproportionately represented on TV. The heavier a female character, the more negative comments were made about her. In the 1990 commercials, white men were often depicted as strong, while white women were shown as sex objects. African American men more often were portrayed as aggressive, and African American women as inconsequential. Ads for household items like cleaning products usually featured women. G-rated movies are commonly viewed by younger children, often over and over on DVD, and perceived by parents as safe for little kids. However, in these movies, whether live action or animated, males are shown more than females by three to one. They are often not shown in relationships and do not solve problems peacefully. In G-rated movies, characters of color are commonly underrepresented and are usually shown as sidekicks or comic relief or bad guys. Male characters of color are more aggressive and isolated. Music videos overrepresent black males as aggressive and white males as victims compared to actual demographic data. How are children portrayed on TV? A study by a group called Children Now of how children are shown on local TV news found that almost half of all stories about children focus on crime. Children account for over a quarter of the US population but only a 10 percent of all local news stories. African-American children account for more than half of all stories, 61% involving children of color, followed by Latino children at 32%. Asian Pacific American and Native American children are virtually invisible in local news. African-American boys are more likely than any other group to be portrayed as perpetrators of crime and violence, whereas Caucasian girls are most likely to be shown as the victim. You will work for me, and in return, you'll receive an allowance. Allowance? Yes, allowance. As in, I'm allowing you to keep 10%, and I'm allowing you to keep drawing breath on this earth. Now, you either get down, or you lay down. What's it gonna be, sunshine? This wasn't no movie. The smart thing was to say yes, get up, and leave the room. But then I thought to myself, what if this was a movie? Look, you, the plane you flew in on, them shoes, the socks with the belt. Neuro-linguistic programming. Neuro refers to the brain and the neural network that feeds the brain. Neurons, or nerve cells, are the working units used by the nervous system to send, receive, and store signals that add up to information. Linguistics refers to the content, both verbal and nonverbal, that moves across and through these pathways. Programming is the way the content or signal is manipulated 
to convert it into useful information. The brain may direct the signal, sequence it, and change it based on our prior experience, or connect it to some other experience we have stored in our brain to convert it into thinking patterns and behaviors that are the essence of our experience of life. Our experience and feelings affects the way we react to external stimuli. Let me illustrate. If I am afraid of snakes, the impulse I get if I see a snake or even hear the sound closely resembling that of a snake is to feel total fright. This is because I was born in an area infested with several deadly snakes. One day, a boy from my neighborhood came to our house. He knocked on the door. He wanted to show me the prize catch he had in his hand. He was holding it like it was a pet cat. For him, it was a pet. So it gave him a lot of joy to hold one. To me, it gave me a migraine headache. Both myself and my neighborhood boy saw the same thing. The same original signal was passed to our brains. It was the picture of a snake. However, our brains interpreted the implications of the snake entirely different. In processing the information, our brains used our experience, good and bad, our biases, our opinions, our value systems, etc., to convert it into useful information that we can use. Neurolinguistic Programming, NLP for short, was developed in the early 1970s by an information scientist and linguistic at the University of California at Santa Cruz. They had observed that people with similar education, training and background and years of experience were achieving widely varying results ranging from wonderful to mediocre. They wanted to know the secrets of effective people. What makes them perform and accomplish things? They were especially interested in the possibility of being able to duplicate the behavior and therefore the competence of these slightly highly effective individuals. It was the golden era of molding and simulation. They decided to model human excellence. They looked at factors such as education, business, and therapy. They have then zeroed in on the communication aspect. They started studying how the successful people communicated verbal language, body language, eye movements, and others. By modeling their behavior, John Grinder and Richard Bandler were able to make out patterns of thinking that assisted in the subjects of success. The two theorized that the brain can learn the healthy patterns and behaviors and that this would bring about the positive physical and emotional effects. What emerged from their work can be known as neuro-linguistic programming. The basic premise of neuro-linguistic programming is that the words we use reflect an inner subconscious perception of our problems. If these words and perceptions are inaccurate, they will create an underlying problem as long as we continue to use and think them. Our attitudes are, in a sense, a self-fulfilling prophecy. The neuro-linguistic therapist will analyze every word and phrase you use in describing your symptoms or concerns about your health. He or she will examine your facial expressions and body movements. After determining problems in your perception, the therapist will help you understand the root cause. The therapist will help you remodel your thoughts and mental associations in order to fix your preconceived notions. These preconceived notions may be keeping you from achieving the success you deserve. Neuro-linguistic programming will help you get out of these unhealthy traits and replace them with positive thoughts and patterns that promote wellness. How does neuro-linguistic programming work? Neuro-linguistic programming uses self-image and attitude towards illness to affect change and to promote healing. Hope is our greatest asset. It is one of the main reasons why placebos work. We also know how effective prayer can be when it is combined with faith and hope. When a person loses hope and feels helpless in the face of a chronic disease such as AIDS or cancer, it is very easy to lose the hope and the body may just quit trying. If the patient is made aware of his or her unique abilities and possibilities, he or she may see things differently. Now the body's natural healing power can be harnessed to do the job. Television Programming and Benjamin Carson The viewer of this program may feel as though the stern recommendations against TV programming is unfounded. 
However, based on solid research, we found that reduced viewing of TV helped many people develop their potential to become successful individuals that benefited society. Consider the interesting biography of renowned neurosurgeon Benjamin Carson and how television affected his life. Benjamin Carson was born in Detroit, Michigan. His mother, Sonia, had dropped out of school in the third grade and married when she was only 13. When Benjamin Carson was only eight, his parents divorced and Mrs. Carson was left to raise Benjamin and his older brother, Curtis, on her own. She worked at two, sometimes three jobs at a time to provide for her boys. Benjamin and his brother fell farther and farther behind in school. In fifth grade, Carson was at the bottom of his class. His classmates called him dummy and he developed a violent, uncontrollable temper. When Mrs. Carson saw Benjamin's failing grades, she determined to turn her son's lives around. She sharply limited the boys' television watching and refused to let them play outside until they had finished their homework each day. She required them to read two library books a week and to give her written reports on their reading, even though, with her own poor education, she could barely read what they had written. Within a few weeks, Carson astonished his classmates by identifying rock samples his teacher had brought to class. He recognized them from one of the books he had read. It was at that moment that I realized I wasn't stupid, he recalled later. Carson continued to amaze his classmates with his newfound knowledge, and within a year, he was at the top of his class. The hunger for knowledge had taken hold of him, and he began to read voraciously on all subjects. He determined to become a physician, and he learned to control the violent temper that still threatened his future. After graduating with honors from his high school, he attended Yale University, where he earned a degree in psychology. From Yale, he went to the medical school of the University of Michigan, where his interest shifted from psychiatry to neurosurgery. His excellent hand-eye coordination and three-dimensional reasoning skills made him a superior surgeon. After medical school, he became a neurosurgery resident at the world-famous John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. At age 32, he became the hospital's director of pediatric neurosurgery. The key theme that we should realize is that by Benjamin's mother's dedication to reducing and even eliminating the need for watching TV, he was able to develop his mental capacity and grow as a productive student. By eliminating television, the child has the great ability to develop in other areas of life that are vital to his or her skills as an adult. Every human being has the potential to significantly benefit society by sound education and the aptitude for excellence in all areas of life. The vast amounts of hours, the decreased social interaction, the violent tendencies, and every other socially unacceptable behavior have all been warranted by the decrepit content on television. Society must uphold a standard as to what is acceptable for humanity instead of allowing the large corporations catering to debased values to propagate the masses with the vilest elements of immorality. But all is not lost. However simple it may seem, with an acceptance of the truth, we can potentially change the history of our past and the upcoming future of our children if we simply turn off the TV. Seek alternative forms of information and do not make the corporate entities richer with useless content often dedicated to social vanities. As the great books of wisdom have stated, happy is the man that finds wisdom and the man that gets understanding. Proverbs 3.13 let us help humanity by turning off TV and seeking divine wisdom in all that we do in life. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Proverbs 4.9 The Creator has endowed humanity with wonderful talent and creativity. With this creativity comes the potential risk of good and evil in whatever new form of technology that comes in the progressing years. When we use our talents to benefit society, we can attain to heights that would bring the world joy beyond measure. Please turn off the TV and reflect on what you have just watched. And always remember, truth doesn't fear investigation.